Machiavelli sought to have said that the ends justify the means and that doing evil is a necessary part of politics. By working through Machiavelli's most famous book, The Prince, we'll see that neither of these claims is entirely true. Machiavelli's advice to new princes is that to live in a world of constant flux, they have to be ready to adapt and transform themselves to suit their situation. They should be bold, seize opportunities, deceive if necessary, use violence judiciously, and control how they appear to others. Machiavelli's prince may appear simple, but as he reminds us, looks can be deceiving. I'm James Muldoon and I'm a lecturer in political science at the University of Exeter. For an introduction to Machiavelli and for more analysis of his political theory, check out my other videos. And don't forget to subscribe for more political philosophy. Aims of the Prince Machiavelli's The Prince is about how new princes can gain and hold new territory. He doesn't provide us with universal rules to follow in every situation. Nor does he describe how an ideal city or an ideal ruler would look. He gives us a lot of historical examples of individuals and actions worthy of imitation. But it's an open question about how we should interpret all of these different and sometimes contradictory examples. He tells us that his book is based on his own personal experiences as a diplomat, and also his readings of ancient history. It's one of the great books on power politics, and has been read by countless politicians attempting to outmaneuver their rivals. One of the reasons it's proved so shocking to generations of readers is that it seems to go against typical advice about the importance of trust and honesty in politics. Machiavelli wrote the book in 1513 after the Medici family had returned to Florence. He was keen to find work with the Medici family despite his connections with the old regime. The Dedication Machiavelli begins the prince with a dedication to Lorenzo Medici, one of the younger members of the ruling Medici family. There are three things worth noting about this dedication. First, what Machiavelli says in this book needs to be understood in the context of him trying to gain favour with the Medicis. It helps us make sense of why a Republican like Machiavelli might say some of the things that he does in this text. The book was originally written for another member of the Medici family, and it's likely that Machiavelli wanted it to have a wider audience still. Second, Machiavelli doesn't use flowery language. He writes in Italian rather than Latin, and seeks to convince you rather than win praise for his literary style. Third, Machiavelli's drawing a lot on his own personal experience, and some of the people that he talks about in the book are those that he actually met on diplomatic missions. But he also wants to draw a lot from the ancient world, and he's very critical of current politicians for not knowing enough about ancient history, particularly of its military missions. Machiavelli thinks that his USP with the Medici family is his knowledge of ancient history combined with his personal, practical experience. New Princes Machiavelli thinks to be an effective leader, one needs to study and learn the examples of great leaders of the past. In Chapter 3, Machiavelli lists four figures that he rates as the most excellent of new princes. These figures were Moses, Cyrus, not Miley Cyrus, Romulus, and Theseus a leading prophet of Judaism, and the founders of Athens, Rome, and Persia. These men were great in Machiavelli's eyes because they were all lawgivers who relied on their own virtue rather than fortune or help from others. He thinks it takes a special creative power to found a new state or religion rather than just expanding an existing one. Even among these semi-mythical state founders, there's no single figure that completely embodies Machiavelli's political ethics. Whatever lessons we draw, it's going to be a collage from different sources. You could say that Machiavelli is the theorist of the pick-and-mix lolly bag. Machiavelli is going to offer us a selection of different treats, but our exact bag is going to depend on our own circumstances and our own tastes and preferences. Just as Machiavelli selectively appropriates from different examples, we as the reader are encouraged to choose our own lessons from the book. In the opening chapters of the book, Machiavelli makes a distinction between different types of states, republics and principalities. He also makes a distinction between different types of rulers, new ones, and ones that gain their territory through hereditary means. It's important to note that he doesn't make a distinction between good and bad states or good and bad rulers. This is important because that is a distinction that was typically made in classical political philosophy. He tells us that The Prince is just about principalities, and we know there's another book called Discourses on Livy, which will be concerned with republics. What Machiavelli is going to be really interested in is new princes that acquire new territory. He thinks that these situations are going to be the most difficult to control. In chapters 6 and 7, Machiavelli makes two of the most important distinctions of the book. Acquiring new territory through your own arms versus acquiring new territory through arms of another, and also the distinction between virtu and fortuna. 
we're going to come back to what virtue or virtue means because Machiavelli is going to redefine a traditional Christian understanding of what it means to be virtuous. The issue of fortuna or fortune is much more simple because Machiavelli simply means luck by this the things that are outside of your control. Machiavelli thinks roughly half of what happens in our lives is up to us and the other half is up to fortune. Let's see a practical example of what Machiavelli means by this. Cesaro Borgia. He introduces the example of Cesaro Borgia, a man who was appointed Duke of Romagna by his father, the Pope Alexander VI. Borgia is Machiavelli's example of a man who comes to power by relying on fortune and the arms of others. Initially, he's impressed by Borgia's cunning and military skills. Although the Duke rose to power through good luck, his skills as a politician allowed him to consolidate his rule. Even though he initially commanded troops given to him by others, he did so skillfully and was able to build up a force of his own. Second, Machiavelli thought Borgia acted ruthlessly where necessary. Borgia persuaded some of his rivals to join him, and for those who didn't, he invited them over with promises of friendship but eventually had them imprisoned and killed. Third, Machiavelli mentions a particular episode where one of the Duke's lieutenants, a man called Romero de Orcho, was put in charge of pacifying the people of Romagna. Romero acted with exceptional cruelty and viciousness in suppressing this people, so much so that he and the Duke began to be despised. The Duke's answer to this was to have Romero hacked in two pieces and placed in the city square. Machiavelli reports that this both satisfied and stunned the people. For Machiavelli, the willingness to act with ruthlessness where necessary made Borgia a shining example to other princes. But he relied too much on his good fortune, and as soon as his father was no longer the Pope, his fate began to change. Because he'd relied so much on his good fortune, as soon as the circumstances were tough, he made a series of miscalculations which led to his demise. A prince should rely on the people. In chapter 9, Machiavelli advises that new princes should base their power on the popolo, the lower social classes, rather than the aristocracy. He says that the aristocracy are motivated by a desire to dominate others. He gives a few reasons why the lower classes will be more trustworthy than the aristocracy. First, aristocrats are not going to see the prince as that much different to themselves. They'll therefore be more likely to turn against him when circumstances dictate. The people, on the other hand, are likely to see the prince as in an elevated position and are going to be more likely to tolerate his mistakes. He also thinks that the lower classes or the people are more easily satisfied with acts of generosity and benevolence. The aristocrats, on the other hand, are more likely to have insatiable appetites. But ultimately, he thinks that a prince should arm the people because they're going to be more reliable and dependent than an aristocracy. The Art of Appearances In chapters 15 to 19, we get to Machiavelli's important lessons about the kind of reputation a prince should cultivate. He makes an important distinction here between how a ruler appears to act and what they should actually do. Everyone sees what you appear to be but few experience what you really are. The people, he says, are impressed by appearances, and it's these that really count in politics. Therefore, what's important for Machiavelli is the kind of reputation that a prince cultivates and the effect this has on other people. He's less concerned about the intrinsic value of the deeds or whether they accord to any kind of moral standard of goodness. Part of becoming a master of appearances is learning to be a shrewd analyst of other people's motivations and actions. In order to avoid falling into the traps of others, the prince will have to learn how to understand the subtleties of human behaviour. One of Machiavelli's main departures from the classical humanist tradition is his advice to wear masks, to deceive, and to appear not as you are. Classical humanists like Cicero advise new princes that they should be honest, trustworthy, and just. Machiavelli advised it would be advantageous to appear to be many of these things, but in reality one had to learn how to be ruthless and deceptive. Morality and Politics the great break that Machiavelli makes with the classical tradition is his separation of a sphere of morality from a sphere of politics. In other words, a prince would have to learn how to act immorally in certain situations to rule effectively. But it's important to note several caveats on Machiavelli's main advice. First, power does not always bring glory. Machiavelli thinks that there are figures in history whose cruelty goes too far, even if they did achieve their political goals. In chapter 8, Machiavelli argues that Agathocles, who became king of Syracuse through inhuman cruelty, should not be celebrated as a great leader. Machiavelli argues that it's possible for a leader to use so much cruelty that they no longer achieve glory. The point at which you draw the line is unclear because there are other politicians that act with excessive cruelty that seem to not fall into this category for Machiavelli. Second, Machiavelli's advice seems to be directed to a very specific political actor, 
a new prince acquiring new territory under very adverse conditions. It's doubtful that Machiavelli would advise all politicians or all people to follow this advice at all times. Third, some of Machiavelli's advice concerns not how to act immorally, but rather how to make difficult decisions when one faces a necessary trade-off between different virtues. For example, his advice not to be overly generous would allow a prince to preserve their resources such that on a later date they would be able to maintain a strong state. An economy of violence. Machiavelli thinks that a prince should always be ready for war, and that they should be very knowledgeable about military matters. He even goes so far as to say that a prince should have no other concern aside from warfare. He doesn't shy away from the necessity of using violence to maintain order within a state. While some other theorists prefer to cloak the necessity of violence in language of justice and legitimacy, Machiavelli openly discusses the use of violence as a necessary means of control. Sheldon Wallen has argued that Machiavelli could be interpreted as putting forward a certain economy of violence. This concerns when and how violence can be used most judiciously. Rather than interpreting Machiavelli as advocating violence and cruelty for its own sake, we could see him as setting out how a new ruler could use violence judiciously such that the total amount of indiscriminate violence is reduced over time. Disorders harm the entire citizenry, while executions ordered by a prince harm only a few individuals. A pity, if it's you. A prince should employ violence rapidly and immediately after taking over a new state. This method would be better than acting with increasing levels of violence, as disturbances and rebellions became more common. Machiavelli thinks that cruelty should not be used with increasing frequency over time. Rewards, on the other hand, should be given out slowly so that people can expect more of them in the future. In a strange twist, he even says that murder might be preferable in certain circumstances rather than stealing somebody's wives or property. People don't forget such theft, and they're likely to want to take revenge for it in the future. The Lion and the Fox it's often said that in politics, people behave like animals. Machiavelli says that if we want to succeed in politics, we have to learn to behave like certain animals when necessary. In Becoming a Master of Appearances, Machiavelli thinks that there are different lessons we can learn from different animals. In particular, the lion and the fox. The lion cannot defend himself from traps, and the fox cannot frighten wolves. One must therefore be a fox to recognise traps, and a lion to frighten the wolves. The lion is an important animal to learn to imitate because by conducting itself with boldness and strength, it learns to frighten away its enemies. Like the lion, one must always be armed and ensure they have the necessary strength to meet their opponents in open battle if necessary. But like the fox, we should be cunning and learn to detect traps set by others. We need to see that the most forceful option is not always the best one. In fact, playing the fox is actually going to be much more effective in achieving most of the prince's aims. Thus, depending on one's situation, one must learn to play the lion and the fox. To be loved or feared. Machiavelli tells us that in terms of a prince's reputation, it's good to be both loved and feared. But if one has to choose between them, it is ultimately better to be feared than to be loved. People are fickle, and he thinks that if it's in their interest, people will betray you. The prince needs to be able to give the people a reason not to betray him, that they fear what would happen if they did. By using the appropriate levels of violence at the beginnings of one's rule, and by striking fear into the hearts of the people, one can avoid being betrayed later on. But Machiavelli also makes an important distinction between being feared and being despised. He doesn't think you should use excessive levels of cruelty such that you become hated by your people, because this will actually encourage rather than deter rebellions. Virtu and Fortuna For the Roman moralist, Fortuna was a goddess whose attention one sought to attract. She was thought to bestow honour, glory and riches on those who displayed manly courage in the face of adversity. In the Christian era, this idea of fortuna or fate was replaced by the idea that our fates were preordained and that there was little that we could do about them. In 15th century Italy, Machiavelli and certain other humanists were starting to return to the idea of the kind of control we might be able to exercise over our fate. Machiavelli employs the metaphor of fortuna as a flood, something which threatens to destroy our plans, but against which we might be able to prepare before it comes. He even suggests that Fortuna takes a certain pleasure in destroying those who don't prepare against it. This is one of the places where the gendered nature of Machiavelli's political theory really starts to show. Fortuna is depicted as a female goddess who on Machiavelli's account yields to certain manly qualities of courage and boldness. In her book Fortune is a Woman, 
Hannah Pitkin suggests that Machiavelli's texts are structured by concerns about being sufficiently masculine and what it means to be a man. Classical Republican politicians have often upheld traditional patriarchal values and have put forward problematic ideas about the feminine or female. Hannah Pitkin reminds us of how much of Machiavelli's politics plays into this pursuit of manliness, heroism, and military virtue. Coming to the end of our analysis, we can see that Machiavelli's account of virtue is going to be radically different from the Christian notion of virtue. Rather than advising princes that they should act with honesty and trustworthiness, Machiavelli says that they should be bold and decisive and take courageous decisions where needed. A prince possessing these attributes is going to be best able to create a strong and unified state. Unifying Italy in the final chapter of The Prince, Machiavelli shows his Florentine patriotism. The title of the chapter says it all, an exhortation to free Italy from the hands of the barbarians. He wanted a future prince, perhaps Lorenzo Medici, perhaps someone else, to use his manual to create a strong and united Italy. Machiavelli advised many new things to new princes, but above all else, he advised that one had to be ready to change to suit your circumstances. Those who are inflexible or are inattentive to changes happening around them are going to be outmaneuvered by their rivals. For an introduction to Machiavelli and for more analysis of his political theory, check out my other videos. And don't forget to subscribe for more political philosophy.